uh, you know, this was just an amazingly great set of talks. Let, let me sort of, uh, you know, the panel, I've, we've sent you some questions, but I think just listening to your talks, you know, so, some, some of these big themes that you've touched on, which I think we can uh, like to just sort of put on your ears. One is, you know, whenever we have, starting with Marzia's talk and your talk, Colin and Santino's, I mean, you know, the fundamental, one of the things I always see when you have machine learning models based, based on past data and you use it to predict the future, you know, I mean, they always suffer from this sense that, you know, there seems to be a sense that the future should be like the past. And the past has had biases and the past has had all kinds of uh, poor data. Why, why, do, why do we feel that we really should have these algorithms where the future looks like the past, the training data? So that's one, one question. And I think Cynthia actually, I think all of you had partial answers to this uh, with one thing. And, and the second thing I wanted to say is this, sort of, of course, this tension between causation and correlation. And I think that this, uh, the Google study certainly about, uh, you know, picking up on uh, pencil marks. And I think Alexander has a study where he puts red dots and green dots on images and, you know, all, all the images for dogs have green dots and those for cats have red dots. And then he uses that, of course, to fool the algorithm. So th this question of, uh, you know, are we, are we stuck with something like that if you, if you stick to uh, correlation? And of course, getting at causation has been so hard and so let me so put that as another theme that you raised. And, and the third one is about the role of models. You know, a, a deep neural network is a model. It really is. And you might call it a black box. It's a, a more complicated model than others. And the question is, why do we not try to understand in a multi-layer neural network, uh, a convolutional network, sort of what exactly the, the the structure of those is, and wh wh why don't we use that in the interpretive of it? So this, this is where, this are three questions, so to speak. But uh, uh, let me tell everybody that's uh, listening in. Also, you, you know, we'll have a few questions just to get warmed up. But I would encourage people to unmute themselves and ask uh, questions as well. So you know, we'd like to make this uh, interactive. My, my only request of people asking questions is please identify yourselves and, uh, and, and then, you know, uh, before you ask your question and keep your questions brief. So uh, let, let me first uh, give uh, uh, each one of the three of you a chance to weigh in because you've raised some really weighty questions, which you know, certainly raised them in the context of healthcare and uh, inequity and training data and all of that. But uh, let, let's let you go through this, uh, perhaps in the order that you spoke, uh, Martier and then Nacentheil and then uh, Colin, sort of as opening statements. And Alex, I see you're back. I think you're back. So I'd love for you to also chime in after uh, Colin. How's that? So uh, is that... Uh, you know, and just to tell you, you know, it's about quality of the data, uh, you know, should be, uh, you know, about this role of training data and uh, this, uh, also about correlation versus causation. And uh, so the other one is about, should we not try to think about how we understand what uh, layers for neural network do? So or other machine learning algorithms. So should we, should we start with you, Marcier, or? Sure. Um, so I, I'm happy to speak about the, the first one and say, I think one of the issues um, consistently that we've seen in machine learning is that when you're looking at a lot of other modalities, we uh, don't require expertise to label or evaluate those modalities. Right, so if we're talking about dogs and cats, you can get undergraduates to label a million dogs and cats for you and they'll probably importantly be consistent. Right, and that I think is the other thing that's really hard. In, in health, we are in a situation where 
experts can train for decades to be radiologists, for example, right? And then these experts are allowed to look at um, an image and disagree about what the label should be for that image. So it's not only that you need really highly specialized people to try to interpret the data you have, so it's harder to figure out the quality of your data and what's going on. It's also that these experts are allowed to have different opinions. And as we've all said, that, that uh, opinion base, that knowledge is allowed to evolve. It's an ongoing process. And so I think those three things sort of make the, the data problem difficult. Um, so for example, I think you said- So this you're saying it's a much more subtle problem than just uh, sort yeah. of image labeling. Yeah. Okay. It's also, I mean, you had said really nicely, well, why do we expect the past in machine learning in general to be predictive of the future? Well, in other domains, it often is, right? We don't often get just a lot of new kinds of dogs, right? But that's just not true in a health setting. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a great set of questions. I I don't even know which one to choose tackle. Choose one since... or all. Let's yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'll... I'd love for you to talk on all of them. You, you know, <laughs> usually, usually what people do is they try and turn the questions into something they already wanted to say anyway. Uh, unfortunately, I I feel like I've already said what I wanted to say anyway. I, I'll let me pick up on the correlation versus causation one because it's an intriguing one. I think one of the things that's currently lacking in our sort of I guess I'd call it on our statistical frameworks, is a richer way of understanding, I would put it almost as sort of three categories. It's not correlation versus causation, I think. I think it's spurious correlations, meaningful correlations, and micro mechanisms. And the mechanisms often we have in mind with, with, with causation, but let me illustrate something in the middle. Um, Blood pressure can be a durable biomarker that we tend to use to guide lots of things and are happy to do that, even failing to have a purely mechanistic understanding of how blood pressure for that condition may be a good marker. And in fact, it may turn out it wasn't the perfect marker, that there's a better marker underneath, or it's just a placeholder for something else, but it's a durable one. It's a meaningful variable. It's correlational, but it's a meaningful correlation we're willing to handle. The mechanistic stuff, as in Colin's stuff, is obviously the holy grail. And to the extent that in things like in cardiology or in other cases where we've got enough mechanistic understanding, it's insane not to take that and put that into the building of our algorithm. That's just, it's just crazy. It doesn't make any sense. So, so that, you know, that makes sense at one end and the spurious correlations being bad makes sense at the other end. I think we don't have a good framework for thinking about the useful correlations, which in fact, a lot of what you look at historically in science has been useful correlation, not causation. So if you looked at astronomy, we've not really had a field that's causal in nature for a long time, or even now in the sense that we're not going to knock planets and say, yes, when we moved Mars, it did what we expect. I mean, it's that we've got highly predictive models where things worked as expected. We had some mechanisms and the mechanisms kept expanding our understanding. So. I think this whole area is gonna be really interesting as we start redoing the statistical underpinning to say, how do we think about these kind of correlations that's kind of useful? Anyway, that's just a thought, so. Uh, Sethi, you, you're, you're, you come from an economics culture. So of course, in econometrics, there's a, been this long standing problem of understanding inputs and outputs. And if somebody gives you a bunch of time series data, how do you determine from, from a given time series data, how you'd label them as inputs and outputs. And, you know, this is, uh, is uh, and, and, you know, recent work, I mean, I'm just a long winded question, but a simple question at the end. So, the, and, you know, Emmanuel Kanders has this uh, set of techniques, statistician at Stanford, you, you must know him, but, you know, he has this sort of knockout techniques, he calls them, for being able to try to understand what is correlated with what. And so now, if we go back and revisit some of those statistical techniques, some of the old techniques, you know, really the econometric literature, this is lots of very old, wonderful stuff, I might say. You know, what, why, I mean, how, how can we bring some of that methodology into deep learning or into this kind of machine learning? It's worth, that, it's worth yeah, it's worth going back and saying, 
why, why did the discipline of econometrics begin in the 50s in the first place? Because it's kind of an interesting historical lesson for our time today. I think now the distinction between econometrics and statistics is fuzzy, but in the 50s, it was very much needed. And here, here's the argument that early econometricians made, which is that we need to incorporate decisions and other, you know, economic, they were focused on prices, but we need to incorporate human decision-making and decision-making into statistical models and that the statistics need to incorporate the decisions. So a classic study was on selection, who got schooling that we need to model who ended up getting schooling versus not. And this idea that we had to take something about the world in that specific case, human beings engaging in economic decisions and incorporating it into the statistical artifact and then understand whether new statistical things came up was very powerful. If we carry that analogy forward today, I think in many ways, what's, what's missing is our enriching our machine learning and statistics artifice for the areas we go into. Healthcare has a bunch of context and understanding, including the biological, physiological understanding from below, but also the understanding of workflows and who ends up where and processes, who gets measured. So these sort of macro and micro things, you all would almost say in healthcare, maybe you need an ML and a statistics that incorporates those. And I think that's part of what we're failing to do is we're trying to take these one size fits all type of things. And you know, if economics was important enough to, to speciate and differentiate, certainly healthcare is more than big enough to speciate mm -hmm. and differentiate. And I think that's one of the things that we'll probably need to get smarter about doing. And that, that's going to require as a discipline to move away from this general athlete notion of like, oh, I'm an ML person to saying, you know, like that, that's just, that, that can only persist for so long. And I think we're seeing the tail end of that general athlete approach. Wonderful. Uh, Rujna, I see your question. I'm going to, let's give Colin an opening statement and then Rujna, you're first in line to jump in. Uh, Colin, you know, when you spoke also, you know, I, I felt really tempted. I mean, you raised this just sort of big questions of epistemology, you know, I mean, really about how, you know, you raised to me this question of what, what do you take home from a AI ML machine learning model in terms of, uh, uh, the you know, sort of and, and you know how does this fit? How do these models fit into you know the other forms of knowledge, be they Newton's laws or uh, uh, Schrodinger's equations? And uh, so, it, 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 will you? Uh, and maybe I'm just waxing unnecessarily uh, philosophical on this uh, point, but uh, is that what you were getting at? Is that really what you were pushing us to do? To uh, Colin? Well, I, I do, I do want to answer that, but I want to follow Sentil's suggestion to answer the question you want to answer. Okay. Here. So, so, so the, the, uh, just about the correlation and, uh, and, and causation issue. So uh, that is, I think, important for a number of reasons, and it, it does get to some of this bias points um, and identifying bias. They, these, these points are in, are very connected in my view. And you know, there's a whole field of causal inference that tries to get get at some of these issues. And and for me, when I hear the correlation ca causation, I think about estimating what we call the individual treatment effect. So uh -huh. looking at the expected uh, effect of giving a treatment to a up to a particular patient, and then for given patients, you can estimate the, the uh, individual treatment effect. And there are standard methods for doing such, you know, for estimating these joint distributions and for building models to do so. And then when the individual treatment effect is different than the probability that a given patient will be given the drug, those are instances where I think one raises the, the idea of, of, of bias. So I, I just say that to say that I think that this is, these, these considerations are important. And there, it, there are working formalisms to try to um, try to attack this with with statistical rigor, and um, so that's that's just those are my thoughts about that. My my comment about the, the my epistemological comment was was really just an example to try to motivate and help us understand what an explanation means. Mm -hmm. 
hmm. getting aside from the, all the technical language that you, that you know this whole field of explainability has 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 come upon, and and, and the point is that. An explanation is meaningful. It has to begin from the premise where two people speak the same language. If I mm. speak French and you speak English, mm. there's no hope that I can hope to explain any concept to you. Mm. And so the explainability in the standard of machine learning is no different. It has to use a lexicon, a vocabulary, mm. a set of concepts more importantly, that are important, that are known to the person who you're trying to explain things to everyone recognizes that they've heard a satisfactory, satisfactory explanation because it is consistent, it, it resonates with some prior concepts that they have. And my, I, think, and I, I think the vein of explaining these deep learning models has to follow the same point, whether it's post hoc or whether it's done from the outset. It has to have a list of concepts that either the cardiologist knows or that the radiologist knows, and it has to rely on them. And I think the explainability field has not at least in medicine has traditionally not done that. It's tried to arrive at explanations that are in line with some technical concept of what's explainable, but it's not satisfactory to the person you want to use the methods. Fantastic. Uh, Alex, I promised to pull you in here. And uh, uh, Alex, if you can weigh in on, you know, also the bias in training data. And if there is, there is bias in training data, the question is, uh, can we ever get away from sort of having the future be different from the past if, uh, if we rely on training data to, to predict what things should be like in the future? Uh, I presume Alex, maybe Alex has not uh, stepped away. Okay, uh, Alex, if you're there, that's good. And if not, oh. Yes. Well, well, I am here, but uh, I'm not a panelist, so. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, no, but I'd love for you to. Uh, well, then, uh, yeah, why don't you jump in and then we have some people in the audience. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, well, you know, I just, uh, you know, just uh, my perspective is kind of simple about, about that. It's like it's in the end, you know, once we realize what the problem is, we need to have some controlling for this. Yes? So in some ways, always, you know, kind of, that's why I think this whole uh, kind of idea of data-driven systems, like fully data-driven system is completely broken. It's yes? like essentially, yes, we should use data, but there has to be some actual uh, kind of effort to kind of align the prior you get from the data with the prior that is desired, right? So it's not very revolutionary to kind of to say this, but I think it's actually not embraced. Like there's kind of this belief that yes, data, you know, kind of everything should be data driven. So, uh, yeah. So, so the point is, like, I'm actually quite optimistic about this, as long as we do not expect too much from these systems. Like, I think as we, as long as we understand the limitations of these tools, they can be extremely, you know, extremely helpful. And you know, my uh, kind of, you know, my uh, somewhat tried analogy here is that, like, you know, it's like the sharp knife. Yes, sharp knife is a very useful tool, but you need to know what you are using it for and what you should not be using it for. And if you use it wrong. You know, you will cut yourself deeply, right? And kind of so. So much of my work, in particular, is trying to understand data, like kind of trying to, you know, before we can do something about biases, we need to recognize them. We need to be able to identify them. We need to understand essentially, like the way I kind of we have this idea. And again, this is hopefully well. This is actually fortunately changing. Is of like thinking of data sets as monoliths, and we really should not think that. You know, data sets are just collections of different trends of different subpopulations. And you should have a way of explicitly identify, identifying them and then correcting some of the biases that the speakers talk about. So this is kind of, you know, I have more thoughts on that, but, uh, you know, more on the technical side. I actually, that's why I'm so excited about this panel, because I want to understand how this plays out in the real world, like in the healthcare, in the healthcare world. But yeah, this is my perspective. I'm actually optimistic, except people are too optimistic, you know, so like when they become more realistic, then we actually will get better. That's how Marcia started her talk. <laughs> yeah. People, uh, do. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Rujna and then Pratik Shah. Uh, you know, if you can tell okay. me on chat, uh, Rujna, please. Well, uh, I, I just uh, please introduce yourself, one sentence, and then you yes. can ask your question. Yeah. Okay, this is Rujna Baiche, and I have emeritus now at UC Berkeley. Uh, a and member of the Academy of Medicine, how's that? Yes, I am, I am. And I have been doing medical imaging forever. Um, my problem, ladies and gentlemen, is that data science 
the science part will not be there as long as the data is not um, not subjected to rigorous data collection. In engineering, we have so-called experimental science, how you set up controlled experiments. And in some biological aspects also, I, but you know, some people kind of thought, well, I just get a lot of data and, and uh, it will wash out. Well, recently I was called in the radiology department at UC San Francisco and asked to detect ultrasound images where the heart valve is not closing. So I said, show me the protocol. How was this data collected? Blank. We don't know. We don't know where the data came from. I said, how do you call, relate the pixel values to actually the tissue ultrasound uh, the detection value. We don't know. So, you know, you can't really do serious science in absence of these factors. So I, I very much enjoyed your presentation. It's just, and, and the fact that you are calling awareness that indeed the quality of data is critical and in healthcare, my God, more than ever. Thank you. Uh, Colin, do you want to respond? Uh, or oh, any one of you, but uh, the cardiologist. On a... <laughs> well, I, I, I will say that we are of the same ilk. Um, uh, um, so the, I, I think that, you know, in, in um, you know, the traditional thing is you, you make a uh, when you're collecting data, it's done in a randomized fashion. You try to control for confounders and you do this in a controlled way. And generally these observational data sets or registries, they arise kind of out, out of thin out of thin air. It's hard to know. I, I, I would like to think that there's some middle, middle ground here because I mean, like to, one would like to be able to leverage these data after the fact, after they're acquired. And, and the question in my mind is how does one develop strategies to mine the data sets that exist for a specific task. Because you know you have a task in mind and how you actually gather the data to accomplish that's gonna be different and, the, and a rigorous protocol to be able to do so and checks to see that the data that you've acquired are actually appropriate so that you don't get radiology images that have big circles on them where the radiologists, they have, they have circled where the, uh, where the you know. So, so, so I think that the, there's you know, these, uh, I, I think a process and some of them Marzea alluded to as well, for understanding what data are most appropriate once a task uh, is, is, is specified, I, I, think, I, think is, I think is important. Uh, anybody else want to dive in? Marzea, you want to uh, I, I just want to say I, these proxies exist in other spaces, right? Like we know there's the famous one of, uh, you know, the, the determinant between I think Husky and Wolf is, is there snow? in the background, right? Because Huskies aren't often photographed in snow, but wolves some of those are, right? So that we know that there are um, proxies embedded because of the human processes that acquire data in other settings or, or for text, right? The kind of slang that you use or how you type, like the, those things we know are good proxies, right? I think that the additional difficulty here really is the nuance and the multiple levels of dating that go into creating this data, right? I love this slide that Colin showed by uh, Harini Suresh, because, or I think maybe Sandal, you showed it, um, because it's showing that this is, this is such a process. You have to decide uh, what kind of studies you're going to fund. So even what problems are you going to look at within the health space, right? And we know some studies or some areas are overfunded in health and some are underfunded. And then you have to recruit people. Well, who do you think gets recruited? who has time to be in these studies. And then once you recruit those people and you get their data, there are biases in the data that you collect and you have models that have biases and you have deployment considerations. And so I think it's just that there are humans in all of these parts of the process that touch how the data will appear. And so that's what sort of stacks up against us. You know, there's a question from Alex, which is related to this on the chat, but let me be directed to Cynthia. But Cynthia, uh, with a little bit of a preamble, you know, I was reading an old paper of yours on uh, 
And if you were looking at racial bias in hiring in some New York uh, city agency, and uh, so that was in your days as a labor, Pratik, you're next, you're next, uh, I'll, be, I'll get you on. But, uh, you know, so Alex's question is, how do you, how do you, so he wants to know, how, how do we systematize collecting data? And so, you know, you, you've had to do this a lot, you know, and uh, I think I'm attributing this paper to you, right? It's an old paper. Of yours. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I barely remember anything that's, that's more than five years ago. So you can attribute anything you want to me and I'll nod my head. Um, I, I, I think that we're going to need, I, I really like the way you put it for Rosina. And I think one thing that you said, Colin, in response, I think I, I, would, I would kind of urge us to think about, which is, you know, the, the wisdom that comes from what we, what we are already doing can shed light on the problems of the new thing and I think that's what we're doing right now. It's like, we see the huge problems with these data sets, but at the same time, we shouldn't pass up the opportunity they offer us. What we should ask is, given all of these problems, what's the architecture that's gonna let them shine? And one way I think about this is that if we bring survey methodology to this work, it's never gonna work. It's simply mm -hmm. not. Because survey methodology involved an actor who had agency, who made deliberate choices around collection. These data are not collected. They are not, that's not the right way to think about it. They're not even data. Let's just get very, let's suppose you have a data set that's what's called the claims data set in healthcare. It's not data, it's billing information. Mm -hmm. Somebody was keeping track of these things in order to bill something to somebody else. That's what it is. It's, it's a database for billing reasons. We've now chosen to treat that database as a data set about the underlying patients about whom agents were making billing choices. Similarly, most of these other things is they are agents who are making choices about what to record for their own purposes. So if we're really going to ask this, I think what we need is a framework that lets us understand the data production process. And I thought that, uh, Rosina, what you said in the chat is right. It's, it's we need, a framework that lets us describe data production processes and that lets us therefore be able to query them and have a common language to communicate them. Mm -hmm. So that when someone says, hey, this is my data, there can be a description of this was the production process. And the production process goes all the way down. If you went to the, if you went to the chief medical officer, and that's a CMO, let's, let's go to the head of uh, cardiology, correct me if this is wrong, Colin. If I went to the head of cardiology, of a big system, I would bet they don't know enough about the practices of the nurses that are doing the EKGs that they could write down the data production process for who gets an EKG. They'd have some sense, a good sense, but the nurses know a lot about who they put the EKG on and who they don't. So the production process information is dispersed throughout the system. And even collecting and organizing the production process information itself is an enormous value add. If a hospital could be shown, this is whom you have data on and how it is produced, that's value add to the agents in the system. It's like, oh, I didn't realize that. So I just think we don't have that way of thinking because we treat these data sets like survey data rather than um, my collaborator Ziad Obermeyer calls these found data. Mm. And in a way it's better to think of that phrase. And I think there's probably an even better phrase underneath it, which is it's sort of data exhaust. It's the thing that's happening I, as a consequence of other stuff. Can I say that you, you speak from my heart. There are, you can, you can and I, whatever I would love to see is that for different machines, for different data acquisitions, you know, MRI versus fMRI, X-ray versus this or that, there should be protocols, rules. This is what you have to tell me about how you got the Period. Wonderful. For let's uh, uh, let's for give Pratik a chance to ask uh, his question. Asu, do you have a quick intervention? You're one of the organizers, so you can always invoke. Uh, uh, okay. Or, Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no. okay. Please go ahead. I, I was going to ask something else. Please go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Is it, is it fine if I ask? Uh, yes, okay. Yes, great. Go, 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 go. Uh, thank you. So I'm yourself. Pratik. I work at. M uh, yeah, I'm Pratik Shah. I am uh, a principal research scientist. Work at MIT. Uh, many familiar faces. Uh, good to see everyone. 
So, so I'm, I'm going to talk about an existential question. So the entire world of data collection is retrospective data mining. And then we do retrospective data mining, and then we don't have a prospective way to validate our algorithms, right? So there is no prospective validation of a lot of the models. And, and the FDA only cares about clinical trials and validation if they are prospectively defined. So we are in this loop where we have retrospective data, no prospective deployment systems, no randomization mechanisms. So what, does the, what do the people on the audience and the, uh, on the panelists think are the first low hanging fruits where all these amazing models we are making can be prospectively deployed and validated in small settings. Maybe it's retrospective data, right? It doesn't matter, we're built on retrospective data, but can we collect prospective information? Where are those low hanging fruits and what are the business plans? I know Sendil is an economist, so we have no, we, we haven't talked about money. So where, 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 are, where are the business plans to support all this deep learning work to scale? Okay, that's a meeting question. Uh, maybe we should let everybody on the panel who wants to weigh in, weigh in. Uh, who wants to go first? So I, I want to say, um, I think the incentives are just misaligned. It's not like we can't do a deployment, right? It's if you have a clinical collaborator, you can do a deployment. So I've done deployments. Most of the people in the machine learning trials community that I know have a deployment that they have done. The issue is what the incentive is and why they've done that. So as an academic, I'm really not incentivized to do a set of robust deployments that could change the use case of uh, you know, technology in a health setting, right? And so the FDA, I think, uh, is doing well for what it's trying to do, which is saying when you have something that you want to say is cleared and now it can be deployed, you have to have it evaluated in this perspective way. And I don't think that that's a huge barrier. I think that there needs to be a better test bed. There needs to be a better sort of middle space where right now what we have to do is elbow our clinical friend and say, let's get this through the IRB. Let's, let's try to do randomization in a specific way. Let's see if that's appropriate. Um, I think that we should have better guidelines for how to include machine learning. And there are some efforts in this direction, right? There's the consort AI and the spirit AI guidelines. But I mean, those don't include, you know, uh, what I think is a huge uh, gap, especially given that they came out uh, just last year, I believe. They don't say that you need to prove that your model works equally well on different subgroups, which feels like a, a huge gap in this day and age, right? Like that, that feels like something that's really missing. Yeah, we so need, we, just to complete, we need a randomization of real world evidence. We need randomized real world evidence for a lot of groups uh, and demographics and subsets of outcomes that we haven't understood yet. So let me, uh, uh, Colin, if you want to go, I, or I can, I can. Oh, no, please, uh, me too, if you can go. I, I, I would, uh, let me zoom back and, and I'll, do, I'll answer your question second, uh, my senior critique. Uh, I'll, let me zoom back and say something first, which is probably a culture clash thing that's worth describing. I think computer scientists are used to a form of fast deployment. And I think that they're frustrated by the slow deployment in healthcare. But I want to flip the script and say, I think that I know of only one other field in all of human existence that has this very nice property that healthcare has, which is healthcare has told you the contract ahead of time about what you need to do to get people, to get them to change the way they, they operate. There's not any other field where someone has said, here's our contract, you follow these rules, we will change what we do. I mean, in every other domain, it's a, it's, it's a diffusion problem. Here they've said, no, 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 here it is, do these things. That's amazing. And the price you pay for that is that their contract is a good, hard binding, like they've actually set the bar for what you have to clear. Of course, it's frustrating to clear it, but that's what you got to clear. And so I think that in many ways, I, I think, It'll be a very, if, if frustrating, but productive experience is sort of the computer science culture clashes against this. And you have all these people saying, oh, this field is so slow. I think they'll slowly come to realize, oh, maybe it's slow and these tripwires are here for a reason. And I think it'll actually turn out to be a very productive clash. So I, that's, that's one meta observation I'd make. The second observation I'd make is that, you know, if you look at dollar investments by VCs into uh, 
sectors, you know, there are a lot of sectors that are getting VC money, but healthcare is getting a buttload of VC. So there's a lot of money, AI innovation money coming in uh, from this space. So in some sense, this is soon going to be a space with a lot of dollars, like, and it already is. And so I think the question you're raising, critique is actually a really important one because I think it's on the thought leaders' shoulders to say, how will this money actually end up being used in a socially productive way versus how will it go towards bad outcomes? And for me, I think the answer is, is, is clear actually here. It's who's at the table. I think one group that would solve all of your problems critique is having somebody who's not here on this, at least on this panel right now, but who's the sort of hospital or health system administrator, mm. the people who understand the system workflows and incentives. And it's amazing, you know, we have a few startups and one of them is with, he's an administrator in the system. And it's amazing how, until he and I started talking a lot, how just, you're not thinking about the system. You're not thinking about where the actual needs are in the system. You're thinking about prediction problems you can solve, things you can automate, but that's not necessarily where the system has the problems that it has. And so having that perspective of that person, and, and Colin, you may have that from your perspective as well, I'm not sure, but it's like, you know, usually it comes from someone far more engrossed in the minutia of the economics than anyone who actually cares about human beings wants to be in, but it's, it's a useful perspective and that's the, the administrator. Anyway, quick, that's quick response is that I saw one NIH SVIR HTTR study sections, and almost all the machine learning algorithms that are adopted in hospitals are simple rule based machine learning hospitals to triage patients and save dollar money. Right? So you're absolutely right, Sandal. The chief information officer is the one who should be at the table saying that we have a need for sepsis, and it's what is your rule based algorithm? So Dasena is one of them, Ritankar Das, I believe, and there's another one called eCart from Chicago, you may know. Those are the only two widely adopted machine learning systems funded by NIH. So you're absolutely right. Hospitals should be at the table. Okay. Can, can I say something? Uh, can, Colin, can we give you a little air time? And then why don't we get uh, uh, Asu, and then I'd like Abigail also to chime in. So just to give you a heads up, Abigail. So, okay, uh, go ahead. Colin, did you want to do a quick intervention before we get to Asu? Well, I, I, think, I think a lot has already been said, you know, um, I, I think the, the, just touch what Marzea said, the, the, the premise that, you know, prospective evaluation really has to be, you know, my interest is myopic. It's, it's on what's best for patients, both scientifically and uh, clinically. And uh, you can't escape that. It's wrong to think that it always means randomization and long, I mean, I think those two things are disjoint. They're not, they're not the same. Because some say some things you can do prospective, they can be quite fast. I think yeah. Alexander wants to jump related to this, Shankar. I can still wait a little more. Go oh, ahead. Hey, Alex. Okay, uh, so this is great. And by the way, what, what Sam here said is great. Let me up the ante because you are right. Like in some ways you are saying, oh, these machine learning people, they just want to kind of, you know, they have the hammer and they're just, you know, they, everything is a nail to them. And that's not how it works. You have to recognize what you should be solving as opposed to you, what is easy for you to solve. Com completely on board on that. But let me up the ante. How, because, you said something very important. Others also said something very important is that, for instance, well, I'm a machine learning person and I'm happy to try to solve your problem as opposed to, you know, as, as opposed to solving my problem. To, but I ask you for two things. First of all, formulate this problem in a way to communicate the problems you actually have, and that's work. Second of all, well, give me, try to at least give me a data, give me a handle on the data that I can work with. I'm happy to accommodate your biases, think about it, and this is super important, super interesting, but like, I'm out of my depth, I don't have this. You know, as you know, from our project we have, there is a lot of like investigative work where we kind of just learn all this minutia and this is like Sherlock Holmes uh, experience. So I understand that this is the state now. So now the question is of incentives. So I want to actually think about incentives of the hospital system. What would you need to show to them for them to have an incentive to change their system at least a little bit to make it easier for you to interface with them. Because for now, we're just saying systems are out there. Now it's your job 
to go and interface. And that's great. That's one thing. But this is a bit of a chicken of an egg, pro an egg problem. Like, what will make the hospitals be willing to actually invest a lot of resources and attention to really document the practices they do and follow them? And again, it's crazy when I'm on this project. I love it, but it's crazy how many idiosyncrasies there is within one system. You know, like, you know, yeah. because this doctor likes to do it that way and this nurse likes yeah. to do it this way. And then you have to make sense of this. And like, you know, I know this is difficult to change. It requires intent and resources. So is there some incentives that we can put to the hospitals to start actually doing something about this? Well, first of all, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna, since you wanna up the ante, Alexander, let me, I'll put that on mute. No, I, I should just give some context that might help and then I'll give a quick answer and trailers have an answer. So. Uh, Alexander and I have been involved in this project that was meant to be a fast project around COVID, but it has been a long project as an illustration. Of, and I have to say, uh, just because I want to see, I've got you on my screen, I want to see if I can make you blush, Alexander. I have to say in the work with Alexander, I think you and your grad students have been a model of what I think machine learning researchers should look like. And let me articulate why that is. Just as much as we need incentives for the systems, which I'm going to come to second, we need incentives for machine learning researchers to not be focused on small papers that they can get published in a conference in two, three months. These are real things. They need real in-depth investigation. And one thing I'm, I've been impressed with your students through Ziad and I'm coming to understand is how they really are willing to go into the details and really understand what is actually happening. And I would say, I'll talk about the hospital systems that I know of and, and Colin, you may know others as well, but for the other incentives that you can all change is the incentive about what it means to be a good scholar, how you reward grad students, how you raise whatever. And I think if you're gonna work in a field like this, it can't be through the same production process of short papers that you turn around in a couple of months because right. that's the easy right. thing. Right. And you guys have done an amazing Absolutely. job. And I think, right, and Alexander, you've got it. Whatever you guys are doing, you should do that. For that systems, look, it's just a public good. So we have one activity, Marzi is involved in this called Nightingale, where we're just taking the public good on, we're getting health systems on board, and we're gonna say, give us the data. Now that's been two years, but we're reaching the near, near the end of it and it's gonna launch. And that's going to have a bunch of these real data sets up for people to access, along with the capacity to do the querying, et cetera, underneath, because we've got that on the back end. So I just think much like there had to be a big data cost born to get image uh, recognition off the ground. I think people have to, and we're trying to bear some of that. I think we'll just have to bear the public good cost of saying we need to get this type of thing out there. I don't think it needs every system. It just needs a couple of systems with some knowledge. And I think that's entirely doable. I think my view on these things is a few exemplar projects that people really like draw everybody in. And I think if we can do the first few correctly in a way that everybody's happy, you know, there's more than enough resources, dollars and human capital ready to flow in. People just need examples that they can copy. So I think if we can get the first five, six done right, you know, it scales itself. I just wanted to comment because I think these conversations are always a little frustrating for me. We, we talk about hospital administrations as being these monolithic you know, things that one have to convince to do something. And in, in my experience, that these things are most successful, they bubble up from the bottom. There are, there are healthcare providers who recognize a problem is important. And oftentimes I think that, you know, when I have discussions with, um, uh, with people in other spaces, and I mean, they, you know, as I think as always, they talk about what they can do as opposed to what they should do. And I think there has to be sort of a, a shift in terms of how one thinks about working in this space and, and the process in which something actually makes it to fruition. There are advocates who are typically healthcare providers who believe that something is, and those, in my experience, have been the most successful. Successful. Uh, successful. I, I really agree with you, Colin. You know, about 20 years ago, I got interested in working with UCSF on endoscopic robotic surgery. And you know, no healthcare provider would give us the time of day. And no, no, sorry, no hospital administrator would give us the time of day. But having a cooperative chief of uh, you know general surgery made all the difference in the world. So I, I, I really, I really resonate with what you just said. I think there are also some barriers that uh, there are some things that you cannot address at a single institution level. So one of the things that 
I have been warned off by every hospital I've talked to is looking at organ transplant lists, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody's happy to say, yeah, of course we report the wait list for our institution to the federal registry, go download that data, the UNAS data. But nobody wants to give you their institution's list of who didn't make it onto the waiting list. Mm -hmm. And I mean, for obvious reasons, nobody wants to get called out as saying that they were racist or they made decisions that were unfair. But if we could have organizations at a high level sort of pool, then this culpability is sort of gone. And then we can move forward towards improving care because nobody is worried that like my hospital will look bad. Colin, you need to take off. So why don't you have a closing word and then you can disappear and then Asu and Abigail next. Colin. Well, I just want to say this is, this is a great, this is a great, uh, a great venue um, to talk about, uh, to talk about, talk about these uh, um, um, issues. These are really important issues. And I really think it needs a melding of the mind minds. I, I think that people who, uh, strive to work in this space, making these clinical connections early on is really important. And discussions that revolve around specific problems are the most fruitful. You know, it, it's very hard, you know, these general discussions about ML in the space because ML in radiology, we've done some talking there, is very different than ML in the space that I'm familiar with, yeah. which is cardiology or very different. So these things are not sort of simple you know, things that you can devise and get solutions that fit everything. Um, so that's my parting, parting thought. I, I think uh, you really resonate with Sentinel too. Yeah, thank you, Colin. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Asu, let me give be sure to give you some air time uh, and Abigail, you're up next, so. Well, I have a very general question, uh, bringing the discussion to the sort of original theme uh, of, the, of the workshop, uh, which is that, you know, AI is great, ML methods uh, will be very helpful, positive effects promise, but also these unintended consequences, right? We've talked about that in social media, we've talked about that uh, sort of in, in the context of mobility. I'm just curious, I mean, we, you already talked about bias or using wrong proxies, but where are the thing, places where you're most you know, cautious about possible unintended consequences, systemic, you know, uh, issues that may arise when we actually deploy these systems because incentives are not aligned because human behavior goes into play or healthcare. I mean, I think I see that in other domains much more easily. I'm just curious uh, your perspective in the context of healthcare, whether those issues are things we should worry about. And if so, how do we actually think about them systematically in deploying these systems as well as think about regulations and interventions in a timely manner? Uh, so I can I can say yeah yeah it's, uh, you uh, there's a there's a, a study that we did uh, that was published earlier this year that shows that state of the art um, sort of chest X ray classifiers right because this is sort of the maybe easiest space to work in because there's lots of data and we have good convolutional neural networks we can fine tune uh, those tend to uh, those tend to underdiagnose. Uh, minorities and minoritized populations. And we are not feeding the demographics into this model uh, when we're having it to the prediction. And so, uh, you know, we published that paper showing that it's happening and we've been scratching our heads for a, a couple of months now trying to figure it out. And uh, we, we're in this really weird space because I'm now in this in like international collaboration with 20 radiologists. And we now have these results that are showing that chest x-rays have uh, in their high frequency information race embedded perfectly. What I mean is if you take a high pass filter on a chest x-ray so that it looks like noise to me and to radiologists and you, uh, you, know, you fine tune a model, a ResNet model on that, um, it can predict race uh, with a test uh, AUC of over 0.9 which is terrifying because that means it's, it, there's a stenographer in this data that none of us would have seen. The radiologists can't tell race from the x-ray, right? Like they don't know what's going on. Uh, and so that's what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid that this perfect information is embedded in a way that we don't see and a model can use that in ways that we won't understand. Wow, that's a scary thought. A high frequency part has a correlation with the race. 
It's not even correlation. A test AUC of 0.95 is unholy. That shouldn't happen. It's not normal. Wow. Well, that's a sobering uh, talk here. Okay, let's uh, be sure to give Abigail, unless she has uh, given up and disappeared. Uh, she had a wonderful comment. Are you, you still on, Abigail? I'm and here. Please identify yourself. Yeah, that's it. Hi, uh, my name is Abigail Wilderidge. I'm an assistant professor at UIUC. I'm, I think, maybe the outlier here. I'm actually a human factors person. I don't do machine learning at all. So this has been quite educational and enlightening, but I kept hearing a few like recurrent themes and some of the questions and responses which were related to how do we identify problems that clinicians want solved? How do we make sense of this field-based data, quote, quote. Um, and I just kept thinking, you know, this is the perfect argument for having, you know, a human factors expert partner with someone who's an expert in machine learning or other AI techniques. Uh -huh. just problems. Um, because human factor, like we have methods to deal with field-based data and do field-based research. And we have really standardized methods to involve users and design um, processes, which it sounds like could be helpful. And then I also wanted to pose a question to, to the speakers. Um, one of the things that I think about is how I do we- I think Sentiel uh, resonated with what you said. So I'm gonna let him uh, finish the rest okay. of your question. Uh, Sentiel, I'm just giving you a heads up there. So the, the question I would like to ask is um, one thing where human factors folks are kind of concerned about is this idea of tailorizing medicine. So using clinical decision support systems, algorithms, et cetera, to basically take the um, professional practice out of medicine. There are pluses and minuses, right? So this is one unintended consequence I'm concerned about uh, that I could see impacting stress and burnout among clinicians. So I wonder what you all think about that and how you're incorporating it in your thought processes. Um, I, I Let me address the thing you said at the beginning, Abigail, and then I'll, I'll answer the second one. I think you're 100% right about the, the role of human factors. Um, and I think the only element I would add here is that it is even an interesting problem here because of the complexity created by the huge numbers of people involved. So even if you took a small hospital that didn't have that many patients, the set of people involved in the construction of that data set is enormous. And so it's kind of an interesting, it's almost like there's a separate data set construction needed. So I, I'm only doubling down on what you're saying, which is that I think the tools, at least as far as I know by human factors, the tools are incredibly adjacent and they'll probably even need, they'll in their use in this context, they, they will tend to evolve. Um, your second question, I, I think I'm, I have a grimmer view than you do, which is it, the tailorization of medicine has already happened. It, um, it was not due to computing, it was due to economic pressures. All you have to do is take a physician note from 1960. Like if you just read a physician note from 1960 and contrast it with a physician note from 2020, it's amazing. It's like night and day. So a physician note from 1960 was a narrative of what the physician saw. In 2020, about half of the text in a physician note are copy pasted from some other patient. And that's like a literal calculation. You can just do it by doing a conjunction. And that's literal copy and paste. If you did how much of it is schematized, formulaic, et cetera, it's close to 100%. Basically, most of the information content that the physician should have been getting is basically dissipating. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. And it's because economic pressures have led, I love your phrase, the tailorization of medicine. Having said that, since we've been pretty negative, let me say that I actually think this is where computing properly deployed could actually serve to detailorize medic medic medicine. Because a lot of, now, it's not gonna happen on its own, but the forward thinking in this, and I think Marzia, you've mentioned this, uh, at least I feel like I've heard you mention this, so if you haven't, I apologize. But the idea is that a lot of physicians, because they're strapped for time, most of the time ends up being spent on various things that in principle could in fact be quite automated. And were it automated, in fact, physicians would do what they're actually good at, which is engaging in, the extreme ends of the diagnostic spectrum, talking to the patient, that's understanding the, the exceptions. Topol. That's the Eric Topol line. The, uh, Perfect. That's, 
that's what he's saying is the premise or the promise of it. Right. The promise of it. And I think that that's, that's not naive. I think it is feasible. We just need us need work to accomplish it and recognize that's the actual goal. Fantastic. I think that this is a optimistic, uh, uh, this optimistic note, let's not uh, let ourselves sink back into, let me turn the uh, floor back to our organizers and uh, uh, Asu, Alex and Saurabh, why don't you come back on and, uh, and uh, I'd love to thank you all for uh, being here, but uh, why don't you come back on and Cynthia, wonderful, and Marcia, wonderful. I, I call in too, and uh, I, I think it's been uh, it's been a most illuminating conversation. As you folks know, those of you on the call, you know this all being recorded on YouTube, but we also will have this all transcribed, and uh, we will the transcribed versions will be put on the after the organizers edit it, they'll put it on their website and so on. So it'll take a little bit, a little bit of time, not too much. But thank you all very much. And Asu, uh, Sarah, Alex. Which of you are here? So Shankar, uh, Alex, yeah. and uh, Asu suggested that I actually uh, do some closing. <coughs> so yeah, I mean, uh, on behalf of the organizers, first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, everybody uh, in terms of uh, participating in our workshop, uh, the panel discussion uh, leaders, as well as the panelists. It was an amazing uh, opportunity to learn more. Um, and it's glad that, you know, glad to know that all this uh, content is going to be recorded and is going to be available after to kind of watch and learn from. Uh, just to summarize and, and try to kind of relate back to our original workshops theme, uh, it was on this uh, four kind of entities or actors or, uh, you know, uh, data algorithms, users and, uh, and uh, regulatory and, uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, they are talking about high level. Uh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so it was, here. yeah, it, it is this four actors, right? But the main thing that we learned, and it, it is just a humbling experience that what we need is a dissection uh, into the domain. And, and, and it's glad that we, we actually organize these works, you know, the, the, each of these days around the, around the specific areas and not some kind of a cookie cutter abstractions and cookie cutter analysis. And in that sense, uh, you know, one of the main insights which I take away from this is that it is really important to kind of specify and actually narrow down into what kind of interactions which we are really focusing on and trying to put data and users and incentives uh, before you know even thinking about uh, you know applying the algorithms directly and trying to draw inferences and conclusions and of course make decisions on them um, and if through the synthesis of these three talks we can actually identify these kind of specific examples of interactions that we can study to kind of dissect and actually benchmark and compare and evaluate uh, given the domain knowledge that would be wonderful and, and I thank all the speakers and the panel leaders uh, for giving us more insight on how to do this. Thank you very much. Asu and Alex. I think it's enough said. I really, I actually will watch this uh, recording again because I think I missed, you know, like I, I think there are even more nuggets of wisdom uh, missed there. And I will be probably also attacking some of the panelists who follow up. So uh, beware. Absolutely. Uh, and I wanted to just add uh, to, thank, to thank everyone, our wonderful speakers, panelists, moderators, uh, and my co-organizers. This was fun putting together and I hope we can continue. These are extremely interesting topics that I think require multiple perspectives. So this sort of bringing together these different perspectives uh, to the same table was extremely, extremely productive. Thank you. Thanks all. Happy spring, everybody. I said happy no roads on the email, uh, but <laughs> maybe there bye. are other. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> bye, Shankar. Bye, Santil, Alexander, Zarov. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. bye. Thank you, Santil.